don't need students to log in. So if we just click on the open course fan, let me see what she was talking about. You, you can click, you can start playing. It's open to public. And then I have this puzzle. Um, ever heard of this puzzle? Okay, it's not puzzling actually. The name is not very representative of what it is. It's misleading a little bit. It's making life simple. <laughs> It's actually a video editing program that interacts with students and that can chase and track student performance. And it's very easy to use, but then you might think like, Oof, who's going to spend all the time to prepare uh, videos edited? Well, I have found open to public access again. And let me play it for you and let me show you what it does. It adds questions into videos that students can answer in different formats.
know most of the YouTube videos are American and they're made by college students and they don't always fit our context, fit our culture, fit our circumstances. So when they hear stuff that refers to them particularly, they're like, Hocam, hocam, bizim için ne yaptınız bu video? Bizi mi anlatıyor? Yes. So uh, that's one way of uh, maybe reaching students. This is about preparing slides and this might save time if you ever have students present in your classes. You don't really have to teach them or to be careful about it. You can just tell them, well, go watch this video and then um, keep in mind what the warnings there are. I'd like to give you some tips about preparing slides for your presentation. It should project a professional image. Lucky you, slides are for free. PowerPoint, Keynote, or Prezi don't charge you per slide. In the past, presenters had to pay for transparencies and permanent markers used with overhead projectors. So now, thanks to presentation software, you don't need to squeeze in a lot of information on a single slide. Each slide should be simple and clear. You can email them, save them on flash disk, or file sharing sites, or apps. Actually, do take a lot of precautions, saving your file on different sources. And remember, Murphy's rule, things do not always run smoothly, especially when... Okay. I'd like to give you some tips about preparing... Let me shut I'd myself like... up, because it's very painful, you know, for a person to hear themselves. I hear myself as a 12-year-old kid, <laughs> and I have to bear with it if I ever play the video in class, but you can always elicit the information here having students listen to watch the video at talk. So, um, as I said, we do need help. We're overcrowded, not as a university, but as a country. We have limited means, so how do we make best use of them? Well, I refer to whatever was free in my hands. Um, the listening. Uh, the listening was problematic because one suggestion was, hey, you, you keep preparing these supplementary materials for the course, but what do I do? Do I need to go to the department, collect a USB, collect the tape rec recorder, and then go to my class? We are like you, we are mobile teachers, uh, which is very tiring, it's exhausting. Together with our laptop and with the tape recorder, with the USB to think about, you know, maybe with the remote, the receiver of the remote, you know, too many things. And they're not necessarily about the content of our course. They're just, you know, these materials that we need support from. So I decided to post my listening materials on YouTube. So this is not a video. It's just the listening. And the handout for the listening, if you ever need note-taking activities, um, if you ever need to start a class without any preparation, there is the listening, there is the audio, and then the answer is also there which is fine because if you ever need to cancel class, this, this week is a typical meta week in which students, the LGBT groups, will be rallying against the president of the university, which is typical on campus. You know, we're going to have the police on campus and classes will be canceled. So what do I do? Because I have this, I have this schedule. I can always tell my students, well, the plan was to do that. You do it at home. And uh, another example is here. So I didn't want our instructors to go to classes with tape recorders. Do you still use tape recorders? We use no. tape recorders. No, we play with Luca. We are not there yet, Hojam. That's phones as well. Right. We are there almost. <laughs> we are Middle East Technical University, <laughs> which hates anything technical. So uh, phones make sense because they are light, they're with you all the time. Yeah, even with that, uh, uh, our mindset has to adapt to it. And uh, with the YouTube listening materials, it was easy. This is another activity that we have on the Open Course that uh, I created with free means that you might use in a relevant context. Uh, my students, and then, see, Technical University Blackboard. <laughs> and then, um, muted videos. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Hey, hey, watch out. This is a clip from a movie.
movie which agrees with the theme of our course. Our course is thematic and the theme was marketing. So I thought, wait a minute, I'm teaching speaking, the theme is marketing. The first time our students go abroad on Erasmus on work and travel on a higher education council scholarship, what they're going to do is not going to be studying. They are used to studying, but they're not used to shopping in English. And they might not know what basmalı kalem is, or they might not know üstü kalsın means, or they might not be able to say like um, bahşiş verecek miyiz, bahşiş oranı ne, you know. All of this stuff that we use in our day language, they're not in course books actually. So I muted a lot of mu uh, marketing related movie scenes, and they're on my YouTube channel. There's a link for the playlist. And First, I asked my students to voice them, to add voiceovers, and that watch out uh, is much better than be careful. That be careful, everybody knows, right? A primary school Turkish student in Turkey can say be careful, but that watch out is very authentic language. And uh, one student once said when I was teaching, Hocam, are you done? I hated that, I got a little offended, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but then he didn't mean any bad. He was like, Hocam, if you're finished, I'd like to leave. But he didn't know the right register, the authentic language, because nobody ever teaches it. So, um, what do we say when somebody dies? We Turks don't say, I'm sorry in Turkish. <coughs> and if you do, sen niye üzülüyorsun ki? Sen bir şey yapmadın ki? Would be uh, the reaction. So, they need to get used to these uh, spoken uh, language fixed phrases and here's one more example we ask teachers might say ne kadar yaptın, neredesin but then where are you is like let me check my GPS and <laughs> tell me my location but how far along do you know we, we need these uh, irrational but fixed phrases that are authentically used in natural context um, we could ask the teachers say can I talk with you uh, but then uh, it could imply other connotations. Can I talk with you? <gasps> you know, can I talk? <laughs> something bad is coming. I'm, I need to expect something bad. Okay, here's another example. The green scarf is... Welcome to Akhlaq Mistel. It costs 500 Turkish liras. How much you like to pay? Here's 100 Turkish liras in cash. Can you put 240 on the scarf? Ro 
shows this awareness about authentic fixed expression music. And then it's, it was fun because now they hear ladies speaking with a men's voice, they laugh, you know, it, even though they're university students, they find a lot of things to laugh at doing such activities. So that's another uh, playlist on my YouTube channel. Music versions and with the ones with voiceovers and um, open to public. So I think the one on the radio was changing in especially uh, especially in young people, young people, because they started to uh, take selfies when they go to school, uh, when they eat dinner at home. Now that was an excerpt uh, from a fake student presentation uh, because, as I said, so many people are taking this course, different instructors every semester. So uh, what do they mean by effective teaser, for example, in the introduction? Those concepts, to clarify them, we needed to talk about tangible, concrete examples. And students didn't want to be exposed to public, but then I found out that some students did accept that. And I had this lawyer write a consent form for me, and then I had 200 students in the course of three years, in the last three years, who volunteered to be recorded and posted online on my YouTube channel so that we can work on them during our standardization sessions as instructors so that students have an idea about what sort of presentations are expected and we can talk about the audiovisuals that are visible over there too. So, um, we needed to insert some sort of re reflection somewhere in our course Somehow, because self-regulation is the big thing now, students need to know what they need to change as strategies so that they can teach themselves how to teach themselves. And for that reason, uh, we designed this um, reflection task. And some students uh, prepared reflection tasks uh, using animated videos. Unfortunately, I was a little bit nervous before the presentation, especially because I am not used to speaking in front of public. I have had only two experiences before, one at prep school and one when I was at high school, where I presented in Turkish, which was much less stressful. I never referred to the crummy piece of paper, which was great because I was kind of ashamed of it. I had totally forgot. robot speak, but the robot is going to speak with the wrong intonation if the punctuation is wrong. So punctuation is very important. The way they divide up their paragraphs, posting to the animation video maker, uh, My Simple Show is the name, My Simple Show. Uh, so their paragraphing is important, which uh, attures a lot of importance to coherence and unity, you know, where the ideas are separated. <coughs> Uh, the flow of ideas. Uh, it's, it's not stressful because they're doing this at home, they're not speaking in front of the public. And it's also good because now they're online and if I have new students this semester, I can always say, well, go look at the old examples and you'll get an idea about the task. Not that they always have to do this this way. This you might want to use. Do you know who she is? She's Billy Zetis who is a graduate of Hacettepe uh, Translation Department and she is one of our instructors who is very much into drama which is perfect for me because I've become this director and she presented for us in the worst way possible so this presentation altogether if you ever need to guide your students in seven minutes how not to present, this is it You're told um, so don't waste that on explaining who you are and just start by entertaining them. Um, yeah, try a, try a story or an attention getting of image on a slide. Yeah. 
up is here. No eye contact, huge note cards, and then like the APA citation is wrong, uh, uh, this and that, you know. Instead of teaching students what to do and what not to do, we can just show them what not to do, make fun of uh, what not to do, and maybe we can uh, uh, keep quiet and have students tell us what not to do. And we also it have student videos. Because 2015, and there is no chance of even a slight increase. In the mobile industry, routine gives legs to a lot of interest. But Nokia's lead has gradually declined in the past few years for a number of very specific reasons. Okay, well, his eye contact is no good because we're using a few prompter, do you know? Mm -hmm. If you just type in few prompter, it will pop up and you can just po uh, uh, copy and paste any text and you can have it scroll in front of your eyes in the paste that you want. That's not what news broadcasters use. That's not what uh, TED speakers, TED talk speakers use. Uh, but the thing about uh, such presentations is that the visuals are embedded in the video, which makes it very visible to the audience. And we're teaching how to present graphs, stages of presenting graphs, and uh, open to public if you ever need them. I'm just going to skip this one. And so today I talked about uh, my open course fair and how I found solutions to some of my problems like reaching out to instructors, not having them carry USBs and not having them sync their drives or drop boxes or like not having them memorize passwords. So what do I do? What do I do? And then I came up with this idea of posting supplementary materials on YouTube whose links are categorized and posted under the open course fair and easily Googleable. Uh, actually, if you even type my name on Google, they will uh, come up. Um, and then I was still shouting out loud, please help somebody help too many students. How do I deal with them? How do I give feedback? How can I ever talk about differentiated learning? How can I ever learn their names, you know, learn who they are, what they need? And then, this tiny little thing here <laughs> turned out to be very, very helpful. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, on that, but if you have questions, I can go into detail. But one way I use the Google Drive for the Academic Presentation Skills course is that students give feedback when they are listening to the presenter about the presenter. So it's synchronous and it's also anonymous. So on their phones, I share with them an editable uh, docs file, and when they're listening to the presenter, they're like, she spoke too much. We don't really need this stuff. We don't have a speaking voice, you know. Uh, constant feedback and anonymous, and it keeps them busy and engaged. Because uh, half of the semester, they end up sitting in passive listening to others present. And uh, the presenter can always go back, and can um, triangulate my data. Like I write on my rubric, I deduct points, and if everyone else, if some other people also say the same things, like no eye contact, the posture was a little um, not self-confident, you know, uh, it would be supported. And then uh, I ask my students to fix the language mistakes sometimes I make notes of, um, again on the same file. So the same file is synchronously being used by me and by the students and it's not like me fixing their English because I can fix English, that I can do. I mean, we are all language teachers, but they are supposed to do it. They're not supposed to notice mistakes, research for the better version, go back and make fixes. And this is a way for me to trace it. And it's also a way for me to collect writing um, I haven't been using paper in a long while, maybe in the last three uh, years. And everything I collect, I collect on Google Docs, having an editable file. And then I can go check, make uh, comments on the sites like this about language, about content, and they can always revise. So that concludes my talk. These are the things I would like to share with, I wanted to share with you today. And I would love it if you have questions now.